Welcome in, everyone, and thank you for listening to the 288th ever episode of the Missouri Sports Podcast, brought to you by, brought to you by 106 Apparel and recording from the MSP studio in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. I'm one of your hosts, Cameron Albert, alongside my good friend and fellow Mizzou fan, Kyle DeVries. How are you doing today, Kyle? Doing great, Cameron. Um, it's a fun time of year. Best time of year? Um, I don't know about I don't know if I'd say that. But Favorite time of year? It's a, probably not, but it's a good time of year. Uh, it'd be better if Missouri was relevant, but yes. uh, they're going to be relevant in the transfer portal. But um, March Madness is it's going to carry on without them. It's but upon us. I'm still going to enjoy it. Um, do you ever think that March Madness starts like kind of late into March? Yeah. Actually, I'm like, it's like halfway through the March and nothing's happened. When the calendar turns over to March, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, March Madness. Oh, it's yeah. it's almost here. And then it's like, you know. You look at the dates and it's like <laughs> three March weeks later. 23rd yeah. is when the tournament starts. Yeah. Not yeah. a fan of that. Yeah. What do we need to do there? Move? You want to shorten the season? No. I was thinking start the college basketball season earlier. Okay. Don't, I don't know the ramifications of Lengthen a change the like month. that. Yeah. Who has the power to do that? Turn April into March 2. Yeah. March Madness is here. Uh, If you want to play in our ESPN Tournament Challenge bracket group, search Missouri Sports Pod. No password needed. Join us. Will there be a prize? We don't know yet. Join us, and if you win, you'll find out if there's a prize or not. (laughs) Um, tournament challenge, ESPN, Missouri Sports Pod. Should they rename their bracket like your your Twitter handle or your like your name yes. or something so we can identify yes. your address? Yes, put <laughs> social, social security. Yeah, yes. Actually, that's probably the shortest one. Just put that in. The there, social right? wouldn't yeah. even help. We wouldn't even know. Yeah, <laughs> but it actually is hard to figure out who you are. Yes. Uh, if we do a prize and somebody wins, it's hard to figure that out. So yeah, put your twitter handle or your email address or something or we'll have you have to have proof they'll have to send a picture of (laughs) that it's you themselves and their computer screen with their bracket on it i think might be what you're looking for (laughs) i i'm thinking selfie okay that's true you have to print it out and write the date on it it. exactly we need a picture of you in front of your computer with today's newspaper Okay, what all are, what all are we talking about this week besides tournament challenge? Uh, we're p- closing the book on Mizzou basketball season now that that's o- officially over. We're going to talk about rebuilding the roster. Some of that has already begun. We're going to talk about another March Madness competition that we are participating in called Marcy's March Madness Player Pool. For more information on that, stick around um that's even more fun than tournament challenge agree disagree probably yeah yeah probably is one more fun uh and we're going to talk about the spring game that happened and all that fun stuff uh before we do all of that don't forget to subscribe on youtube leave us a review wherever you listen to us and you can support us directly on patreon patreon.com slash missouri sports pod kyle mizzou basketball is officially over missouri lost to georgia in the sec tournament Play in round 64 to 59. They finished the season with an overall record of 8 and 24, including an historic 0 and 18 in SEC play. And they take a 19 game losing streak into next season. When, when I was watching the Georgia game, we're going to probably spend too much time on the Georgia game, but I need to get it all out of me. Let's hear it so that I can move on. Okay. When I was watching the Georgia game, I realized how badly I did not want this losing streak to carry over in next season. Like, it just occurred to me that this can happen. It's a burden. And a curse, maybe, even. Yeah. And watching the Georgia game, I was, like, able to convince myself that I was having fun. It was fun, but I was treating the game... I thought they were going to win. I was treating the game like it was the national championship. Oh, wow. That's how bad I wanted them to win. And I realized, like, all of a sudden, it's coming upon me in the second half... I'm watching Sean East, Noah Carter, Nick Honor, realizing this is going to be their last game, and this, I want them to go out with a win. Well, they're going to lose the next day. Well, I, you know. Yeah, I got you. It was going to be over for me. And, and if they beat Georgia, 
then that's all I needed. Okay. You know, end the curse, end the losing streak. Uh, but they couldn't do it. And the, the whole game, I mean, it was an ugly game. Georgia probably should have ran away with it, I guess. My biggest takeaway was Georgia is also bad, but Mizzou's on another level. Uh, Georgia jumped out to a 16-5 to lead early, and it was like some of the worst basketball you've ever seen from Mizzou. Mizzou eventually went on a run to tie the game at halftime. They had no business making it that close at halftime. Missouri was up 59-52 to with under four minutes left in the game. Up seven, under four minutes left. Georgia ends the game on a 12-0 run. Missouri did not score another point after they were up 59-52 with three and a half minutes left. The final two minutes of the game was just the stuff of nightmares. And like, let me just read you a couple things from the play-by-play. At a minute and a half, Georgia takes the lead, 60 to 59. The rest of what happens for Missouri, Nick Honor missed three-point jumper. Connor Vanover defensive rebound. Nick Honor missed jumper. Noah Carter offensive rebound. Noah Carter missed layup. Connor Vanover offensive rebound. Connor Vanover missed two-point tip shot. Are you picturing it, Kyle? Yeah. I remember it. I watched it. And then it all came down to three-point game. Missouri has the ball. They set up a perfect play for Noah Carter to have a wide-open three. And he missed it. It would have sent the game into overtime if he made it, and Missouri probably would have lost in overtime. But just... I just heard you say a lot of names that are not going to be on this team anymore. That is true. And I'm... It's probably... No offense to those guys. Thank you for your contributions. It's probably, probably a good thing. Those last few sequences when Missouri had the ball were just like so emblematic of the entire season. Yeah. Like Nick, th- Nick Honor trying to take over. Yeah. And doing like ISO, like fadeaway jumper in the lane. Vanover, who had a re- one of his best games in a Mizzou uniform against Georgia, has the ball right there, misses the tip in. It was rough. It's all um, over now, Cam. Yeah. And yeah, just how fitting though for Honor and Carter to be like missing those shots in clutch moments at the end. And I, I immediately felt bad for both of them, especially because like Sean East, yeah, he was part of this awful season and um, doesn't get to play for Mizzou ever again, but he at least personally had a okay season good season but honor and carter that was it was just rough all season long and the yeah. emotions were overcoming nick honor and the handshake line uh no the camera lingered on noah carter after he missed the potential game tying shot it's such a it's such a bad run out for like how good of a season we had last year yeah. just uh, i i don't know if i want to use the word erased but it almost does feel like we just erased all the progress, all of the good feelings, all the goodwill. And Nick Honor and Noah Carter played pretty significant roles yeah. in that team. Sean East played significant roles on last year's team. And so, you know, they come back for to renew this special feeling, and it's just absolutely destroyed. Yeah, so last year's team now at this point will always be Kobe, Demoy Hodge, uh, Golston. Yeah. That's like now I feel like in Mizzou fans, that's their team. Pretty much. And East, Honor, and Carter are going to be more associated with this team. Yeah. And yeah, that's unfortunate because yeah. they, they couldn't have had the season they did last year without those guys. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work out this year. I was watching a lot more college basketball over the weekend uh, after that game. And I, I just like, I don't know. It's like a different sport. Yeah, the players that are making plays on these teams. I mean, like Georgia. Blue Kane, dominant. Freshman, true freshman, Blue Kane for Georgia beat Missouri. And then, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just looking around the... Getting torched by the IT guy. Yeah, exactly. 
I'm watching NC State, watching Mohamed Diara and NC State win the ACC tournament. That's happened one too many times as far as I'm concerned where a player leaves Missouri and then goes somewhere else and is great. Great. Yeah. yeah. Like, that has to stop happening. He's had know. a fantastic second half of the season. That now is they're in almost the tournament. as worrisome to me that we didn't recognize what we had. Yeah. And I don't know. Don't, I don't want to pile it on too much, but that was just yet another thing where it's like, how do we let that guy walk? So we're going to get to rebuilding the roster here shortly, but give me where you're at with Dennis Gates. I mean, obviously he's not going anywhere this off season, but it is a historically bad season. And is there room to be like questioning? Like, I mean, I just feel like the question is how do you let it, how does this, something like this happen? Oh, absolutely. You have room to question. We just, well, I mean, we've lost 19 games in a row, Cameron. We haven't yeah. won a game since 2023. <laughs> uh, there's room to cre- to question. And yeah, last season was great. And uh, he stored up a lot of goodwill, but... Um, it's, it's all gone. That's a long, that was a long time ago <laughs> at this point, as far as you know, sports are concerned. Uh, I do think that I could answer that question a little bit better, maybe like a month or two from now, whenever I have a chance to see what we can bring, in, like what the roster construction looks like, whether it's, you know who's leaving and who's coming in. So um, I feel like I had a pretty good read on l- last year's like transfer class and obviously ended up going way worse than I thought and injuries and stuff. But um, I think we'll have a better picture of how year three is going to go um, probably in the next month or two. I feel like I can talk myself into a couple different ways of thinking about it. Like, I mean, you're exactly right that with all of this stuff, only time will tell what kind of roster he's able to put back together for next year and, It'll be very interesting to see who from this current roster, who coach the coaching staff doubles down on yeah. and says, yeah, let's run it back with these, you know, five or six guys yeah. uh, that yeah, were part of was, a winless SEC season. Yeah, what was a fluke? Because yeah. uh, it's very easy to be like, I don't know, I can talk myself into, okay, Tanja got hurt, uh, Caleb Grill got hurt, and, um, you know, just super unlucky bounces a few times that this was the roster that was assembled was not a historically bad roster maybe just a normally bad one yeah but there's not enough there to like be optimistic without some serious pedigree joining the team yeah yeah and um you know i think we can always talk about how freshmen take a while to contribute and even top 100 freshmen have an adjustment period and stuff but i'm afraid we just didn't see enough at all all the all of the opportunity in the world i think if you're gonna get something meaningful out of a player typically they're gonna flash in uh, even as a freshman with the kind of usage opportunities that these guys had and they just never did so i'm a little bit worried um about what's gonna happen with those guys and whether i'm not sure if any of them return but we'll just have to see what happens the Georgia game was a weird, a little bit of an outlier because if you look at the whole season, it was very rare that the coaching staff went with five guys all playing 30 plus minutes in a single game. And in the Georgia game, Sean East, 39 minutes, Tamar Bates, 37, Nick Honor, 35, Vanover, 33, and Noah Carter, 31. So he went with those five almost exclusively and almost worked. Oh, yeah, almost got the win. Um, yeah, uh, the Missouri as a team shot four of 21 from three. That's good for 19%. So that's probably not going to get it done. Most games. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just too early to see. We're going to have to bring in some transfers and then we're going to be, you know, looking to develop some of these younger guys. I think, uh, maybe in a few weeks, maybe after the tournament and, um, once we get a better idea of what the roster is going to look like, we might break it down a little bit, go player by player and talk about what we expect from them and that sort of thing. Uh, but as of right now, there is some big news because uh, the roster be- rebuild starts right now with the addition of Tennessee Martin transfer Jacob Cruz. Originally from Florida, he spent two seasons at North Florida, I believe 
played one season at junior college, and then this past year was at uh, UT Martin, and uh, now he's a Missouri Tiger. Yeah, pretty unique uh, path for Jacob Cruz, but uh, I mean, he had an incredible season last year, um, but really just exploded completely um, comparatively to what he had done statistically and in prior seasons, but mm -hmm. You know, I think he's an he's an exciting profile. He's uh, he's a big guard. He's six eight. Uh, he shoots the three ball really well. I think he shot forty one percent last year. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's probably like the number one thing I want to see like in in a transfer is that's that's like the first thing I'm looking at is their three point shooting percentage because that's something that translates. And you know, I think we've especially at high volume. Right. Exactly. And, you know, I think we've, uh, you know, added guys in the past where, you know, they're high volume scorers at lower levels, but they don't shoot the three ball well. And I think that just is can sometimes end up being a little fraudulent at the next level because it means they're just, you know, bullying guys in the lane. And um, so that might work at the mid-major level, but it's tough for that to translate. And so I am I think that's one of the easiest ways to tell if a guy is going to be able to, to be successful at the next level is three-point shooting percentage. So love seeing that. He's a uh, really like rangy guard, long arms, rebounds really well. So those were two of the biggest things that I wanted to see them add in the portal. And I think that we got that. Yeah. Um, to put the three-point shooting in context here, he was this past season at UT Martin, 80 three-point makes and 193 attempts. So to compare that to Mizzou, um, he made seven more threes than Nick Honor on seven fewer attempts. And Nick Honor had the most three-point attempts on the Missouri roster this past season. So um, you know how many times, how many threes Nick Honor shot. He shot 200, and you know what that looks like. So you can basically visualize that, but, but he's shooting 41.5%, uh, Jacob Cruz is. And um, positionally, he's very intriguing to me. Because I've seen him listed any, I mean, on Ken Palm, I'm looking right now, he's listed 6'8". The tweets about him transferring and stuff all say 6'8". I saw some people saying 6'6". I think 6'8 I think is closer to the real number. And at UT Martin, he was primarily used as like a stretch four. But I'm seeing him referred to as guard a lot on the internet. So I just feel like there's a lot of versatility there with him playing the three and four spot for sure, mm -hmm. maybe some two. And I mean, at six, eight, UT Martin was playing him as a small ball five sometimes. Yeah. So just very versatile. And in addition to his three point shooting, he also shot 55% from two, which is heights helping him there. And I watched some highlights of him and he really was scoring all three levels, posting guys up, uh, driving left or right, had a post spin move. Um, really good one dribble pull up, uh, pulling up in transition from three. I mean, all stuff that looks like it could translate immediately. Yeah. Uh, I think I immediately started, you know, then thinking about the personnel um, and how this affects Missouri's roster. Uh, you know, I started thinking about Tamar Bates. I started thinking about um, even Javon Porter. Yeah. Like, how does this affect the rest of the roster? Um, and I don't really know that it does necessarily, or even I was thinking about Caleb Grill. Does this, you mm -hmm. know, how does this affect Caleb Grill? But I don't know that it really does because because of the versatility. You can't really nail him down to like, oh, he's a three guard or, you know, right. he does this one thing. Um, that means that this other person has to leave now. So right. I don't think that we really f found anything out with the who does this affect, but I know that we added a, a lot of talent. So oh, it's almost like the perfect first addition yeah. to where now have the flexibility yes you can go lots of different ways yeah um but yeah just looking at his metrics obviously like tennessee martin they were 217th in kim palm as a team that tied for first in the ohio valley conference so we're not talking about a very good conference competition level not the best so that is literally my only question mark or hesitation and I don't even think it is a hesitation, but it is something to think about is just competition level yeah. translating to the SEC. But everything else, I mean, for his in-conference play, his offensive rating was, you know, through the roof, um, super efficient scoring, 
good rebounding metrics, low turnover percentage, um, not getting called for fouls, getting to the free throw line. Literally everything looks fantastic. Yep. I think it's a great start. Um, yeah. So we also got some news about players departing Mizzou basketball. And so far that is limited to just uh, Jesus Carolero Martin and Mebor Majak have or will enter the transfer portal. I think Majak made it official that he's in the transfer portal. Um, so two guys that uh, I didn't even realize Majak still had eligibility after this year. But um, yeah, I mean, this was this is only the beginning. <laughs> Wish them well. And I've got some more, uh, some updates on a couple uh, portal targets and some new names to throw at you, Kyle. And maybe we can talk about who we would hope to see um, commit to Mizzou from the portal next. Uh, obviously, everybody knows about Javon Porter. Um, one of his Pepperdine teammates committed to Alabama interesting that alabama is like about to play an ncaa tournament game and they're still working the phones getting a portal commitment yes never stops uh and extending their coach too oh yeah you got a big big deal yeah uh yeah i for one was hoping nate oates would take his talents to the nba but it's gonna be around a little a little while longer not quite yet um Specifically with Javon Porter, I saw something interesting um, when I was just searching his name on Twitter, as you do, and I saw a Denver Nuggets beat re- beat writer was talking about talking to MPJ and asked MPJ if he would consider recruiting Javon to the state of Colorado so they could be near each other. And Michael Porter Jr. said that he, he, it was a very playful back and forth, but he said, no, um, that'd be fine. But basically he said he needs to go wherever they're going to pay him because he said it is uh, get your bag season. There's money to be had. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> he knows a thing or two about that. Yes. Uh, so MPJ knows what's going on. And uh, I think Missouri can do that. Hopefully they understand the benefits uh, regarding NIL playing in the state of Missouri. But uh, other than that, all quiet on the Javon Porter front. It hasn't even been announced publicly that Missouri has made contact. Yeah, there's been been very little information on that once he officially was in the portal. When you saw the Dennis Gates bat signal go out on Twitter, were you thinking Porter? Um... Not really. I wasn't um, either. Just because there, I just haven't heard anything. Um, I was shocked to get a, a bat signal at all. It honestly. seemed like it was pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, I thought that it was either going to be somebody random, or I thought it might be uh, somebody that we're about to talk about. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. Next guy on my list is Taurus Reed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, he is officially in the portal. Big man from or played at Michigan. Originally from St. Louis played high school ball at Chaminade, Missouri, recruited him out of high school, not this current staff. Um, So that might be a hurdle to overcome is the Coach Gates and company are not as familiar with him recruiting wise, but um, he's in the transfer portal. Uh, Let me pull up his stats a little bit. Um, When your team is winless in conference play, uh, you start looking towards next season. So, Cameron, that's what you've been doing for a little while. So you have been waiting for Taurus Reed to enter the transfer portal for several weeks now. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I've mentioned on the episode on the <laughs> podcast a few times before it was official. Um, but, yeah, it, I, you know, Michigan also 8-24 and 24 yeah. on the season. Hey. Uh, moved on from Juwan Howard. Uh, they're also losing Doug McDaniel. So uh, no, no Mizzou connection there. Unfortunately. The writing was on the wall for a little while there. Yes. Uh, but Taurus Reed listed at 6'10", 265. He was just a sophomore this past season, just finished his sophomore season, um, started 31 games for Michigan this year. Um, and he's just uh, he's a young big man who has the skills to you know, be a starting five in in uh 
major college basketball. I yeah. mean, he, he could develop more, but uh, he was getting decent usage in the post, uh, shot 58% from two, uh, sorry, 52% from two. And um, I, I don't know, just a little bit more efficiency. And I think he, I mean, he's going to be, he would, he's going to be solid center. Yeah. Two more seasons, wherever he goes. Mm-hmm. His block shots percentage is solid. Obviously a great rebounder at 6'10", yeah. 265. Runs the floor well. Yeah. Yeah, he would fit uh, really, I think, exactly what we're, we're looking to do. Um, so I think he's probably going to be priority number one or number two at this point. Um, but um, I don't remember where I was going with that. I do, I've done this like every week now for the last like month where I'm saying something. I'm just like, I, that, that's as far as my memory went. That's as, all right. As far, as far as the words were going in my brain. I think uh, Reed and Javon Porter could be a nice yeah. four or five combo. Mm-hmm. It would remind me a little bit of like Jonte Jeremiah Tillman mm-hmm. combination there. Um, yeah, I, you got to like Missouri's chances to get a kid to come back home. Yeah, I definitely thought it was going to be, well, I didn't think it was going to be this, but when I saw the bat signal, I thought this might be like basically just a flip situation, mm-hmm. which yeah. because he had announced he was entering the portal just, I mean, maybe like an hour before the yeah. bat signal came out. So I was like, well, this might be happening. I don't know. Yeah, uh, kind of like Toriano Pride in football, Basically. where he's like, enter the portal and then immediately... Yeah. I thought it might be one of those situations, mm-hmm. but uh, we'll see. Not quite. It still could be close. Um, yeah, so Porter, Reed, another guy that Missouri, that on three is reporting that Missouri has made contact with is Drexel, big man, transfer Amari Williams. Ironically, also listed at 6'10", 265. So this might be one or the other. I don't think that Williams and Reed are necessarily both uh, coming to Mizzou. But um, Amari Williams, his tape is fantastic. He had outrageous usage at Drexel. Very um, just like soft touch in the paint. Not He's got the size to like bully guys around, but he didn't have to. He was fading away little hook shots and uh, really just dominant scorer and rebounder for Drexel. Um, I think he is going to end up like a, a big time program. Maybe Missouri. What's a, what's an example of a big time program, Cameron? I don't want to say the other ones. Uh, Isn't it amazing watching basketball when the shots go in? It's something like, else. Wow, this is... Wow, these this happens sometimes. I bet Amari Williams goes to a place where the shot go, shots go in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, maybe a long shot there. Everybody's in on him, but Missouri has reached out. Uh, a couple others that uh, Missouri has reached out to. Um, I've got two guards slash wings here that are kind of almost identical transfer portal prospects. The first one is Marcus Foster from Furman. And the other one is Kylan Milton from Arkansas Pine Bluff. So uh, both both of these guys, not on great teams, both listed at 6'4", and are a little bit of like do-it-all wing guard combos. I don't think they're necessarily, they're not really like running point, but they are distributing a bit, slashing, one thing with both of these guys, not great three-point shooting, but they're rebounding really well for their size, getting to the free throw line, and distributing the ball some. Yeah. May not be guys that we land, but can still be helpful to maybe see what kind of player they're yeah. they're looking for in the portal. And yeah, I think they're definitely looking for guys who can draw fouls and get rebounds, and uh, we just haven't done that well um, the last two years, especially rebounding. Um, another player is, um, central Arkansas's Cameron Hunter. He actually didn't play at all this past season. Uh, but going back two years ago, he was on central Arkansas and, um, he has reported contact from Missouri. Uh, let me pull him up here. Uh, six, three guard, uh, again, all these guys shooting around 30 to 35 percent from three um distributing rebounding getting to the free throw line that's like all three of these guards it's a theme yeah um and then i only have one more name as far as like a guy this 
last guy that I have is one that I think legitimately could announce that he's coming to Mizzou like any day now, potentially. He's like the next one that I feel pretty solid about. And that is Sincere Parker from St. Louis. Let me pull him up. Originally from Rockford, Illinois. Uh, he's listed at 6'3", 195. Now, what's a little bit different about him is he, this past season, shot 44% from three. Uh, was injured part of the season, but uh, so he actually only played in 15 games. So a little bit of a small sample size, but when he was out there for SLU, he was just a scoring machine. I'm looking at three 30-plus scoring performances, um, multiple four three-point makes in a game, getting to the free throw line, rebounding well. So I, I'm putting him above, as far as like preference, I'm putting him above the rest of those guards I mentioned just because... He's bringing a lot of the same stuff, but he's hitting threes at 44% instead of 34%. Yeah, that's that's attractive. And got the Illinois connection with <clears throat> Gates, and you know he's already in the state of Missouri currently. Mm-hmm. Feels feels like a match. Feels to me. good. Yeah. Um, I think I saw there were almost 500 players in the portal in the first 24 hours. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've maybe said this before. I don't know, but I've been thinking it that this is now the most important recruiting in college basketball. The top 100 recruits are nice. The top five class is nice. Uh, And maybe that's how you build the foundation of your team. But this is now the most important way to build your roster. And because I think maybe most importantly, it's because we have a sample size of these players playing at the college level. Mm -hmm. And so it's so much easier to know what you're getting in a player um, when a lot of times, you know, you're re- in recruiting in high school, you're recruiting like 17 year old kids. You just don't know how they're going to develop um, and how they're going to translate to the next level. And, you know, maybe there's opportunities to zig when everyone else is zagging. You can go get really talented high school kids when everybody's focused on the portal. Mm-hmm. There might've been a little bit of that happening and I think that's going to pay off, but there's really no excuse to go to like, you have to go get some st- like supreme talent um in in the talent in the uh well i said talent pool but that's basically what it is yeah transfer transfer portal um but that's one of the most frustrating things about this what happened this year is that you know like you miss on some high school kid who you thought you saw potential there but it just didn't pan out that's Mm -hmm. one thing but what we've always said is recruiting from the transfer portal you know what you're getting yeah and that's just like, I don't know. I just, I'll never, I think Mizzou fans will just never not think about like, what did you think, what roster did you think you were building, right. coach? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That'll always be there, but they certainly have a chance to redeem themselves. There's just, there's yeah. so much talent out there. You just yeah. got to go find it. Did you have anybody that, any random uh, transfer portal person that I, I didn't mention? No, I think you covered it. Okay. Um. Awesome. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the NCAA tournament here and maybe talk about what teams we like. But I also want to mention the, uh, once again, Marcy's March Madness Player Pool. It is uh, a competition that Kyle and I did last year. And uh, we're basically inviting anybody that's listening to this to come participate. There were 109 entries. And um, we actually have, we're trying to get more this year. We actually have an interview that we recorded earlier with the person running the competition. His name is Mason. So he joined us to talk about it um, and sort of like his inspiration for doing it. Uh, But the way it works is the only thing that it's similar to, I think, is if you have played playoff best ball, uh, fantasy, uh, daily fantasy type of competition, Basically, you pick 12 players and their point totals throughout the length of the tournament are your team's score, and whoever has the most points with their squad at the end of the NCAA tournament wins. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're picking individual players, and um, it's kind of divided up by 
by seeding, but um, yeah, you're trying to obviously pick players who are going to score a lot of points, but also balance that with teams that are going to make it deep into the tournament. So in a way, you're almost kind of like picking brackets. Like you're kind of trying to pick teams that you think are going to make it far. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's some, it's a really unique uh, way to think about March Madness. And it is fun for us because we get to do a little bit more research and, you know, really strategize and build the roster how we want to. And um, it's really a cool, unique thing. Yeah. So the thing that makes it most difficult is you can't just pick all the best players because of your 12 players that are going to be on your squad, you have to pick three players on teams seated one through four, and you can only pick three. You pick three players from teams seated five through eight, three from teams seated nine through 12, and three players from teams seated 13 through 16. So you are forced to find some guys on these teams that are most likely going to get bounced in the first round. But if you pick the player on the right team that scores a first round upset, you're getting those second round points when a lot of the competition is not getting those. Yeah. And last year I had uh, Matt Bradley from San Diego state who was on a five seed team that made it all the way to the national championship game. My one through four seed guys did okay, but it was my five seed Matt Bradley and my five seed Miami. Uh, yeah. I can't remember his name. I didn't pick Wong. I picked the other guy and I, I lost it. Yes, you did very well in this tournament last year, and you won some money. I won a little bit of money. I got second place, actually. Beginner's luck, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, so it's but, just it's fun because yeah. Uh, yeah, you can't pick all you know. You can't pick the best players from all the one seeds and two seeds and yeah. think you're going to do well because yep. that's not allowed for sure. Yeah, and Mason went to Mizzou, and uh, some of the proceeds go to uh, a charity. Mm -hmm. to uh, benefit cancer research so it's just a really cool it's kind of a win-win you know um yeah. some of your your money goes to a good cause and it's just a really cool unique thing uh, it's it's really fun for us basketball junkies so assuming we figured all all this on the back end here's an interview with mason all right we are here with mason of marcy's march madness player pool uh mason thanks for coming on with us thanks for having me um We'll talk about uh, the player pool and everything, um, introduce our listeners to it and how it works, but we really wanted to hear from you how you got started uh, with this competition and your inspiration for all of it, because that's a great story. And uh, so, yeah, take it away. Sure, sure. Thanks. Um, as I said, I'll kind of leave leave the, the details to you in terms of sort of what, how you play it and the rules, et cetera. Um, but the genesis for this, for, for entertainment's sake, I'll give you the long version. Um, you know, it really, the origin of the player pool started uh, while I was in college at, at the University of Missouri. Uh, a few of friends and I were huddled around a folding table one morning after a, a long night out and sort of discussing what, what the upcoming March would bring, specifically as it relates to March Madness tournament. You know, we're all big basketball fans. That was sort of in a the heat of, of Mizzou basketball there with Kim English and Denman and, and all okay. the boys. So it was a lot of fun. Um, that's a little Missouri sports uh, reference for you guys there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we were sort of scrambling to find ways to keep ourselves occupied. Um, and, and effectively, this concept of a player pool, which is really just similar to any fantasy sport um, individual player concept, that we've all grown to love, but adapted to meet a few of the growing concerns that we all had as it related to uh, March Madness. So um, me and my buddies do believe that this is like the best time of the year. Um, just the excitement in the games and everything wrapped into it and then followed by the Masters. It's, it's really the best time in sports. Um, but, but the idea or the concept being outside of the games, your brackets would constantly be getting busted after the first two days. Um, and whether it was for just competition or betting, et cetera, um, we're trying to find ways to, to sort of adapt to, to those needs, as I mentioned. So um, these four or five guys sort of huddled around this folding table um, really grew into something much greater um, over the last few years. What started with like five, as I mentioned, you know, grew into, you know, I think we had 109 um, last year and, and looking to grow that hopefully up to about 150 this year. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was that was really the genesis. Um, 
the sort of what we'll call the, the turning point or, or pivotal moment for me is sort of towards the end of my college career um, sort of experience with, with philanthropy. Um, I was a, a chairman, a co-chairman of a single chapter philanthropy at Mizzou called Rockathon um, with my co-chair, Josh Oresti, current residing in, in Kansas City. Shout out, Josh. Um, and sort of through that in, in our efforts, you know, we actually set two records um, while we were there, which at the time was, hold on, I'm actually getting a, a phone call. Can you still hear me? Yep, you're good. All right. So d- during those time there, uh, we actually set the record two times as uh, the largest single chapter philanthropy in the nation. Um, over the two events, it was biennial. Um, it's 126 hours total. We raised $252,000 for the American Cancer Society. Wow. And, and through that, um, you know, my relationship with cancer um, had been, you know, just like a lot of others, which was, you know, I knew someone or um, it hadn't really affected me up until that point. Um, and then upon graduation in 2015, my mother was actually diagnosed with cancer. Um, and, and unfortunately, subsequently thereafter, she, she passed the following year in 2016. And then that's when the shift sort of occurred where, you know, I was able to marry both a, a personal interest, but also a passion in philanthropy with my passion for March Madness. Um, and, and what was the the player pool quickly became Marcy's March Madness player pool, which is the name of my mother. Um, so th- through that, you know, we, we took a very small piece of what the entry fee was. Um, and, and paired with uh, what was, you know, my family started a foundation, uh, Marcy Bickshorn's um, Sarcoma Research Fund, uh, which specifically partners with Washington University's Seitman Cancer Center and Dr. Brian Vantine uh, to, to fund research towards sarcoma specifically. Mm-hmm. Um, so that has sort of been uh, sort of my, uh, my why over the last few years. Um, and and it's truly humbling how, you know, people have sort of uh morphed in as we mentioned earlier with ryan and his wife and a few others this is sort of morphed into uh bigger than myself so yeah um a few nights pumping out some excel um turning this around you know people you know they need the update as soon as games end um while i still have a life and a fiance and a full-time job and a house to renovate um i i try to get it out at least every round um so we've, you know, again, this has turned into something where I've been approached by other other leagues um, to sort of standardize this white box and maybe turn it into something greater. Um, I've worked with some really great people who've donated their time and skill set to maybe grow this into something that becomes more standardized and it can be applied to other sports and other tournaments. Um, really, the, the the opportunities are endless, but again, that that why and the reason for doing this at the end of the day is is philanthropic. Yeah. Well, all of that, that aspect of it absolutely is awesome. And, uh, what a great way to honor your mom's memory. Um, yeah, just very impressive. Um, to talk about the structure of it a little bit, what it did, had you seen something previously, um, that included having to choose players from all the different seed or the different seeding groups? Uh, or was that something that you guys came up with just to add fun to it? Yeah, it's definitely something we came up with, um, again, around around this folding table. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, initially, the the idea or concept of a snake draft, um, you know, admittedly, we were, we were too tired to kind of wait around and have everybody research and pick. So everyone kind of went off on their own, and, and those were sort of the rules we put in place. Um, and while I'm sure there are things out there like this, mm-hmm. um, I haven't seen them yet. Um, I do believe that this is a unique differentiated product um, that obviously anyone can copy. And, 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 you know, I think mimicry is the the best form of flattery and um, you would, would love to see it. I think it keeps you involved, right. Um, yeah. Sort of throughout and uh, keeps you from going chalk, which I think is everyone kind of poo poos the idea of everybody going chalk. So yes, um, it, it, it keeps it fun, right. It's uh your 13 over a four is a little bit more sweet. Uh, if, if you got two guys stacked up in, in your, you know, your middle Tennessee state games and, and whatnot. So, uh, no, I haven't seen anything like it to date, but, um, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. So Kyle and I participated last year, um, 
and we've done other sports gambling stuff with like um it reminds me the best way i could describe it to somebody that doesn't know anything about it is it's similar to playoff best ball in like the nfl fantasy world but yeah the the part where you have to pick i I don't know i just love going through and finding a guy that's on a 14 seed team you know doing that research trying to figure out which because there's so many different ways you can go with it do i want to find a team that I think can legitimately win and then just pick their best player? Or do I want a guy who's guaranteed to go for 25 in the first round? And, um, yeah, Kyle and I will get into like our, um, how we're going about it and we'll share with our listeners, uh, the guys that we're interested in. But, um, yeah, Kyle, do you want to talk about yeah, Mason, I'm not, I'm not proud of this, but I think I was like a bottom five finisher uh, last year. But I, I know what I'm doing now, so I'm going to I'm gonna do better this year. But um, I love, I mean, you've got something great going on here, truly. the It's such a cool thing. I mean, the, the names are ready to go like the night that selection, you know, it's like selection Sunday happens and like the names are ready to go. Uh, the template is super clean and it's like really um not confusing at all once you kind of understand what you're doing you can just copy and paste the names right in um do you have any help with that or like how do you manage the workload like how do you how did you make that happen so quickly no it's fascinating it's a great it's a great question um i will say i'll give a shout out to brent from nebraska so i um putting this together it became so cumbersome and such a burden that for the last seven years, I have partnered with Brent and I Venmo him every year and he sends me the data the night of. Um, I will say, sadly, he didn't get me the right data this year in the format Uh-oh. I like. So I had to grab, normally I every Sunday night I get it. It's like clockwork. Selection Sunday is at like five or, or six. I was in Colorado two nights ago. So um, he sent it right away. Um, I sort of just pumped out the new format, um, just how I want to see it. You know, he gives me all the data, um, but I, you know, we, we try to limit it. You know what I mean? So like a lot of this format can be, uh, overbearing for some, it can be a little intimidating, um, especially for those who, I mean, Mizzou has been out of it. So this is probably the year I know the least bit about college basketball than I probably ever have. Yeah, us too, unfortunately. But, but at the end of the day, you know, points is probably simpler you know if we wanted to add more he provides that data too but he provides the subset of data um i sort of data mine and then reformat into what you see it as that or as the submission template um but no that's um i guess my background is in um financial modeling Hmm. um and i've been a heavy heavy excel work for for years um so that's you know any excel um excel nerd or you know jockey out there they'll tell you it's it's a pretty simple format um there's nothing special in there it's just just looks pretty i'd say i'm somewhat of an excel expert myself but i'm pretty impressed i think you, <laughs> you guys do a great job no, i appreciate it yeah thank you um as far as picking players do you have any tips for people that might be listening that uh are going to participate for the first time it seems like maybe there's a trend or maybe uh it, picking multiple players from the same team just going all in on like your championship pick seems to be maybe a good strategy we don't want to give away all the secrets but yeah yeah cam i'll tell you like at the end of the day there's just been doing this for so long you know i have a few buddies that have been with it literally since the start or a year two um i i could call them all out by name but i'll (laughs) I'll save that for text after um at the end of the day, there's no one right strategy. I've seen people win or come close to winning every which way. I, th- I think you're right. Um, I think if you want to get, it's all luck, just like a bracket or just like anything in March Madness, literally anyone can win. Um, and anyone is still in it. I've seen people come back from literally like two people left in the tournament in the Elite Eight and and win because they ride them to the championship. But doubling up is just high risk, high reward, right? So yeah. it just depends whether or not you're willing to diversify. Um, but you know, I, I've seen people, I remember a couple of years ago, um, a kid, a kid, I was buddy was back in college. He, he tripled up. I think he went three deep on Baylor. Mm. Um, and I, I think it worked for a little and then they got out. Um, last year, I think a couple guys went pretty deep on Creighton. Yeah. Um, I went deep on Miami and it worked mm-hmm. out, but 
Um, I think it's unique. Um, it's, it's high risk, high reward. If you double up or triple up and they get bumped in the first round, I mean, you, I'd say you probably have no shot of winning. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's every year I switch back and forth. Um, you know, do you want to go high on the guys that are, you know, your, your Florida Gulf coast and get lucky and then you ride them to the, the final four or something like that. It's, you just got to get lucky. I remember Thomas walk up for, for anyone who remembers him at yeah. uh, Stephen F. Austin, um, the lumberjacks. He, he's a hero of mine. Um, <laughs> I get his name tattooed on me. Um, if it wasn't strange. So he, uh, <laughs> Guys like that, I remember uh, Sindarius Thornwell. Yeah, some guys went deep on him and, and a few other South Carolina, and it just turned out well. So yeah, um, you know, and I, and I like to kind of pull back from a lot of that data. Obviously, I have a folder on my computer where I maintain all the data from years over time, and you know, my update emails are becoming very cumbersome. But um, you know, I like to you know yell back. I think someone, my, my fiance, makes fun of me all the time. She's like, you know, guys just like hanging around and just saying names of like old athletes. Yes. That's just like what they do. So I, I, I will say I love doing that and um, just pulling back on old data is a, a good time. So no, no one right way to do it long winded, but uh, yeah. yeah last last year, I year. Didn't, it never even occurred to me to double up. And I was like hyper-focused on making sure my guys wouldn't play each other. Like that's what I was really focusing on and the, it worked all right. So I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Do you ever have anybody do more than one entry? Is that allowed? Um, you know, uh, it is allowed. I mean, the way I see it again, it's um, at the end of the day, it's for charity. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, again, it's at this point, it's been a $25 entry with the minimum of five going to uh, the research fund. Um, if you want to double up, you know, more the merrier in my opinion. And I think this thing is such, such based in luck. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it really increases your chances. I, I was doing like hours of research last night and I was just like, I'm like, man, there's so many things I want to do. So many strats I want to try. So I'm like, I wonder if I could just do two of these, these puppies and, and try different stuff. Feel free if you'd like. Yeah, I can already see Kyle thinking about the different builds he wants to try out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's funny. Well, Mason, I won't take, we won't take any more of your time. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. We're excited to uh, talk about the players that we like and um, get our entries submitted. I'm actually waiting for the results of Colorado Boise State tomorrow because I think I might go with one of those guys. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for coming on with us. No, thank you all for having me. Um... It's strange, you know, never, this isn't about me or not about really the, the player pool at all, but um, really just, you know, giving back and, and trying to raise money for cancer research is, is the number one goal here. So again, thanks for having me on and uh, have a good March here. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see if we can uh, drum up some more entries. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. And we're back from the interview. Uh, I want to mention the there's an email address if you want to participate in the description, playerpoolmadness at gmail.com. Just send an email to playerpoolmadness at gmail.com saying that you want to participate and you will get sent uh, how to sign up and how to submit your team and everything. It's all, all the instructions are there. It seems like a lot at first, but just read it. It makes sense. And see if you can beat me and Kyle. And producer Cameron, you're going to be participating? Maybe. We'll see. We might. We'll try to force them to I'm, participate. I'm, yeah. I'm going to give it a go. So. Okay. Okay. That's, that's, what like to hear. that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So good luck out there. Maybe we'll, uh, you know, we're raising money for charity together. Um, before we talk about the spring game, uh, let's talk about the NCAA tournament in general. Kyle, we did not try to, we didn't have you predict all the seeds this year. We, you know, we haven't quite been as locked in. I was a little, I was a little bit out of the picture this year. <laughs> uh, a lot more going on in my life, probably too, and I didn't take a stab at it. Uh, but that is something I've loved to do. Like the last couple of years, is try to predict the seedings for the entire tournament, and uh, something that I feel like I just naturally have done well. Yeah. So I took a stab at it, but yeah, yeah I, I'm kind of glad I didn't do it this year. Actually, I'm pretty sure last year you were like compared to all the bracket matrix entries, you were like top five in accuracy. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, 
yeah, maybe it's best that you didn't do it this year because nobody is happy with the seeding yeah. of the tournament. Uh, more like pushback on it than I've ever seen before, I think. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of complaining online about the seedings and even what teams made it and what teams didn't, like way more than normal. Um, I think that's always a thing, but this it feels like this committee really didn't do a great job. And I'm not really sure what their like main criteria was, but um, some pretty big snubs and some pretty weird, some pretty weird seedings for people that do this regularly. People that do this very well really struggled, and you know were very inaccurate in their predictions. And I've seen a lot of people just saying like, apparently the selection committee is not paying attention to net rating, which yeah. we thought was like the yeah. biggest factor. Yeah, I've seen some like actual coaches just like yeah. sounding off on like the net rankings. And uh, I, th- I think of course, uh, Patino was yeah. uh, one of those people because he does that for, with, you know, he'll say whatever. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah. St. John's was the um, highest rated Ken Palm team to not make the tournament. They were 26th in Kempom. Uh, Wake Forest was in there. Villanova, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh was on the bubble. Um, one of the biggest snubs, I think, was Indiana State. It, it just is. It yeah. sucks that the they, Missouri Valley is a one big, yeah, one bid league. Yeah, they deserve to be in, in my opinion. But I knew they probably wouldn't make it. Um, one, just because they are Missouri Valley Conference, and it has tended to be a, a one bid league really the last decade. I mean, in the past, I mean, sometimes you'd see multiple at-large teams make it from the Missouri Valley but that's just how it hasn't been it hasn't been that way in in the past and uh, also it was just like a really bad like conference uh tournament run out for them like Mm. a lot of one seeds lost and just like a lot of people were stealing bids and stuff so I was NC State I knew for sure that uh they would not make it after the way that all the tournaments went yeah um well who are you liking in the tournament what teams, who's going to win the whole thing? I filled out a few brackets. Um, and honestly, like, I kind of think, let's see, I don't know. I, I mean, Connecticut, they're they're the favorite, UConn. Uh, I think Houston, Houston's got a chance. Um, I really think Illinois has, like, a pr- pretty nice path. I always feel like I have them going pretty far. Um, and then we've both talked about Auburn. I have Auburn beating UConn fairly often like in i don't know when that would be sweet 16 elite eight Mm -hmm. range i mean auburn has they're just a really really solid team yeah i i mean they made quick work of the sec tournament they had some help from other upsets and stuff but i think that's a really tough quadrant is that the east uh yes that is probably by far the toughest one yeah terrible draw for auburn yeah i think Yeah. yeah you know i mean you could say terrible draw for uconn but i'm i'm thinking Auburn would have to play, assuming they beat Yale, they would have to play San Diego State in the second round, five seed again. They made it to the national championship last year as a five seed. Mm -hmm. And if they beat San Diego State, which has one of the best defenses in the country, Mm -hmm. then they have to play UConn. And then, yeah, whoever comes out of the 2-3 situation between Illinois and Iowa State, maybe. I'm not as scared as of Iowa State, but they had a really good uh, Big 12 season. Yeah. Um, uh, I think last year was the five seed domination, yeah. like two five seeds in the final, the four. final four. Yeah. Um, but I actually think that it's going to be, I don't know if I'd say the opposite, but I would say probably at least two of the five seeds lose their first game this year. I think the 12 seeds are tough. Mm-hmm. Um, Andy Kennedy at UAB. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, there's a couple of, 6-11 matchups where the 11 seed is actually like the Ken Palm favorite and the betting favorite. Yeah. I think New Mexico is one of those teams. They're fi- I think they're favorited over... Do you know who they're playing off the top of their head? Clemson? Mm, yes. Uh, so that's one I think I've picked almost every bracket I filled out. Yeah, New Mexico is going to be like the most popular upset yes. pick and I'm going to pick them in like... Yeah, it's, it's super chalk, all of but brackets. I think I'm just going to pick it anyway. Um, and I think Drake is a 10 seed that's favorite. That's the favorite over the 7 seed they're playing which I can't remember off the top of my head. Washington State. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's, that's which in is, that same East region. Which is maybe, again, just a testament to like the poor job the committee did seeding these teams. Mm-hmm. Uh, FAU made the Final Four last year yeah. as a nine seed. People were not happy about their seed. They're an eight seed this year. So they're, again, in that East region would play UConn in the uh, second round if they both win. 
Um, yeah, just uh, again, it felt like the committee showed a lot of preference to Power 5 teams. You're in a Power 5 conference. You can still lose 15 games and get in. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, Michigan State, super weird resume. Yeah, some of the Mountain West teams, I think a lot of people thought that they were um, like underseeded. So just a lack of respect for some of those smaller conferences. Um, do you remember what happened last time Caleb Love played in a NCAA tournament? Yeah. And he's back. He's back. Uh, Pac-12 player of the year, Arizona, two seed. They were two seed last year, got upset by Princeton. I don't remember what happened after that. Caleb Love, Caleb Love wasn't on that team. True. I, I, I'm going to, that's going to be like appointment viewing, I think, Caleb Love every time he plays in this tournament. And maybe a guy I have to pick in the player pool. Yep. I definitely considered him. Um, a couple, uh, one random uh, matchup, South Carolina, Oregon. Um, in Fale Dante, we actually watched him play in the Tournament of Champions like four years ago um, here in Springfield. Also, Jermaine Cuisinart, uh, former, he's getting a revenge game. He's now with Oregon playing his old team, South Carolina. How did I do on that pronunciation? That's great. Okay. Yeah, I actually noticed that a lot going through the player pool name. Some like, this guy played in the Tournament of Champions. This yes. Guy, <laughs> just yeah. all these names look familiar. Uh, Jacoby Walter at Baylor. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that, I, I like Oregon over South Carolina quite a bit as yeah. an upset. Yeah. No no offense to South yeah, Carolina. Yeah, it might be a strong year for the 11 seeds as well. Uh, Kansas, um, we just found out right before we started recording that, uh, what's his name? Kevin Mc- McCuller? Yeah. Who cares what his name is? No, yeah. Well, One of their players. He's out for the tournament. He's out. So I actually like them to lose to Stanford anyway, even with course. them. Of course, me too. Like legitimately. Oh, okay. Like, they're going to lose. All right, I'll pick them. I'll pick them to lose. Now, it's a blood bank guarantee. Wait, now, are you actually going to pick them to lose? Cause oh, yeah. usually what you do oh, okay, here we go. is <laughs> it, whatever fan base you're competing against, you fade the fan base's trendy pick. Yeah. And yeah, listeners, I, if you don't remember, Kyle won the Power Mizzou bracket challenge two years ago because he picked the team... He picked the correct national champion, and that was the Kansas Jayhawks. Yeah. I guess I... Uh, I don't blame you. I, it's like, okay, they, these people just are all going to be picking with their heart here. Let me just see if I can win some free membership here. That's how you do it. And like that was a little too easy, but uh, <laughs> the, I hope it doesn't happen again. It, and it won't. I, no. I, 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 don't even, I don't feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> it won't happen again. But for real, though, Kansas is out round one. Wow. Okay. Um, is this the year that Tennessee makes a run? It feels mm. like we've been waiting for that forever. Probably not. Okay. Uh, can Kentucky overcome their lack of defense? I, I mean, yes, I think they can. Um, yeah, I think they can do it. Okay. Who's the, uh, I think North Carolina is the weakest one seed. I have them losing. I have them like losing in the first weekend, like a fair amount of the time. Okay, to but to Mississippi State. I have had that. Yes. Okay. Interesting. Um, Florida gonna have a little bit of a rough go because they lost uh, Micah Handlogton. Mm-hmm. Gruesome yeah, that injury. Was, that was awful in the SEC tournament. Uh, they'll play the winner of the play-in game between Boise State and Colorado. Yeah, Boise State, another team that definitely got shafted having mm-hmm. to play in the playing game. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky's in that same region as Houston, and Marquette is the two seed. I feel like nobody's talking about Marquette. Yeah, Marquette, uh, they're one of their best players has been hurt for the last month or so, but I think he's going to be back for the tournament. They were a two seed last year, I believe, and maybe lost in the second round. Yeah, they didn't do anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to lose. Yeah. Uh, a one or two seed. I mean, it's it's you happened think? almost every year. Yeah, like you can't really predict it. This but a, yeah, the last year marked the first time that a 15 seed had won three years in a row, and uh, Purdue lost as a one seed too. Correct. Yeah, I mean, it, at this point, it feels like as flat as the landscape is, it feels like it's bound to happen even more this year than it has in the past. But we'll see. Is Purdue going to pull the Virginia and lose as a one seed and then win the whole thing? It definitely feels like they could. 
And then maybe the most important team in the whole tournament, Will Wade, is back, folks. Will Wade and McNeese State are that in, is in one the NCAA tournament. Goofy, scummy dude, but yeah. he knows how to coach basketball. You cannot apparently, deny that. Apparently. Yeah. McNeese State. Who did they play again? Gonzaga. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, the, there was a. I saw somebody on Twitter said, I don't know who's going to win this game, but whoever does is going to the Final Four. <laughs> Yeah, uh, somebody was sharing around a screenshot of McNeese State's non-conference schedule, <laughs> and it was really something. I got I got to pull it up here. Yeah, let's hear this. Because I feel like Will Wade, he knew what to do. Just go in, schedule like schedule to get thirty wins. You need that number next to your name. So in their non-conference schedule, they have wins against Champion Christian, non D one. Something called Letonu. Wow. L E capital T O U R N E A U. Did you? I guess they're. You French. have a background in French. I just gave it a try. That was really nice. They have a win against Mississippi University for women, who apparently has a men's basketball team. Am or I did f- they play the women's team? I think they played the men's team. What was the score? 92 to 23. Uh, that might have been the women's team. Maybe. I don't, I see, I think this is like illegal scheduling going on because they got a 12 seed and then they lost to like Western Carolina or somebody. They did lose to Western Carolina. They lost to Southern, they lost to Southeastern Louisiana with 303 in Kempom. 12 seed. I mean, that's just, I don't know. The weirdest thing on, on uh, their schedule though is a game against biblical studies. And I have to imagine that's just like that department at McNeese State at their own, have, at their own university. They just threw together a squad real quick. Counts as a win. And so biblical studies got beat 96 to 55. It's pretty good. That's pretty good. We're assuming these guys don't play basketball, actually. Right. So... Yeah, I mean, I, say, I mean McNeese State, I mean... I don't know. They might. They could win this. They might go to the Final Four. They might lose by 50 to Gonzaga. Like, nothing will surprise me. There's nothing they could do that will surprise me. No, I agree. Number three offense in Kempom. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's <laughs> wrong. That's wrong. That's <laughs> Illinois. Sorry. I clicked the wrong thing. <laughs> it's pretty different. Number 50. Oh, okay. Number 50. Yeah, that's not bad. Still good. Um. Yeah, so what did we gather here? McNeese, McNeese State going all the way, probably. Give me a final four of, if I'm really trying to give you something here. But you are. Give me a final four of Auburn, Houston, Creighton. Which means they would have to beat Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Okay. And New Mexico. Oh my! I love it. That's New Mexico is a trendy pick, but I feel like it's just Jalen House. It's too much. He's yeah. good. Yeah, another guy we watched play in the Tournament of Champions. Yeah, I need to just make a bracket where anybody yes. who played in the Tournament of Champions goes as far as they can. Yes, I like that. Yeah, it will uh, be- that's uh, Patino, yeah. New Mexico. Yeah. Oh, his son Richard. Richard. Wow. Yeah. You can't have both of them in a no, tournament no, no, at the no, same no. time. No, that's dangerous. Too much patino. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, is, are you ready to talk about football for a yeah. little bit? We could do that all day. Yeah. Just <laughs> probably shouldn't publish that. <laughs> just clicking on just, just nonsense. Just clicking on on teams and just be like, remember this guy? Remember <laughs> this guy? Oh, he's coaching here. Just making that a podcast for everybody. Hey, hey you're welcome. Uh, okay. Moving on to football. Before we move on. Playerpoolmadness at gmail.com. Tournament challenge, Missouri Sports Pod. We'll see you in both places. Yeah. Uh, we watched the Mizzou football spring game. Before we, sorry, sorry. The NFL combine happened. We didn't really talk about that much because it was a little bit lackluster performance from the Mizzou guys. And Basically, all of them said, 
I'm not done. Stay tuned for Pro Day, which is now in three days on the 22nd. So we took we listened to them. We said, okay, forget about the combine. We're ready for Pro Day. Yeah, Cody Schrader, <clears throat> he hurt his hamstring in the 40-yard dash and just kind of pulled out of the combine after that. Uh, Darius Robinson uh, had an okay 40. I think he ran like a 4.95. Uh, on the bench press, I think he did 21, but then tweeted later that the like the standard or the the bench press was unacceptable. The setup was no the good. The setup, yes, the yeah. setup was unacceptable uh, because like the they had like carpet that was like moving or mm-hmm. I don't know. It was just he said it was unlevel. Yeah, something was not good about it, and so he was going to retest. Can we uh, get our guy a proper setup? We need a proper setup for these athletes. Yeah. They're trying to make some money. Seriously. Uh, anyway, so he's going to retest the, at the pro day, and I would certainly hope that he does more than 21 or else that's going to be a little embarrassing. Yeah. But I have faith in him. I'm wearing his hoodie. Oh, yeah. Looking good. Thanks. Um, yeah, Chris Abramstrain, Ennis Rakestraw, just okay days. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think they lost themselves money necessarily, but I don't think they necessarily came in and, and blew anybody away either. So um, I still think Rakestraw is probably a borderline uh, round one pick. Uh, Chris Abrams Drain, probably around two or three pick. And uh, Robinson, he's probably got a shot at, at first round as well. It's just a little bit deflating after, I mean, the hype was really rolling yeah. going into the combine. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, yeah, just a little bit lackluster. But I, I really, I don't know. I don't know the NFL scouts, how they compare combine results to pro day results. But I do feel like there's something. They're going to be back in a familiar environment. Oh, yeah. A little bit more relaxed. Uh, for sure. And, uh, yeah, looking forward to see what they can do on the pro day. But the current Mizzou football players had their spring game, and uh, we were trying to figure out beforehand what the format would be, and we just assumed it would be, like, the ones on offense versus the twos on defense and vice versa. But they actually did a draft to determine the black team and the gold team. And uh, so that was kind of interesting made it a little bit harder to like discern the depth chart a little bit oh yeah and that was out the window yeah so that is like one of the biggest things to maybe try to discern so and the thing is the coaches probably don't even know at this point so it's probably like exercise and utility anyway but uh, it is like still fun just to see like who's playing with who and yeah um that kind of stuff but yeah that was kind of all just random yeah so i'm trying to think of any takeaways um Going into it, we were talking about the running back room, and we got to see all four of the top running backs get some play. Yeah, it was also uh, no tackle. So that basically made the run game completely worthless. Like, there's nothing you can take away from this um, because, you know, they would get, like, two yards and just get touched, and that was the end of the play. It didn't stop them from calling up QB runs. Oh, my gosh. Drawing up QB runs. Yeah, uh, at one point, the announcer was like, yeah, we probably won't see very many runs from Brady Cook today, and he runs like three or four plays in a row after yes. that. Yeah. <laughs> I think he even said something like, all right, well, don't listen to me. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of quarterback running. Uh, Brady Cook uh, did have a nice touchdown pass to Joshua Manning. Mm-hmm. That was probably like the play of the day. Mm-hmm. Um, kind maybe, of like a, sorry, go ahead. Kind of escaped the pocket, and kind of it was maybe like a 35, 40-yard touchdown. So that was nice. I thought Joshua Manning had a really nice day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was thinking of another play of the day would be Toriano Pride's interception yeah. of Brady Cook, I think. I don't know. Brady Cook threw it? I actually don't even know. I don't remember either. Um, yeah, Underthrown so, ball, but yeah. Pride played it perfectly. Yes. Um, I thought um, the defensive end transfer, um, Smith. Darius Smith. Yes, yes. He looked really good yeah. against, uh, you know, some of the backup offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chris McClellan, I thought, had some good moments. Um, yeah. It would have been nice to have, like, an actual backup quarterback out there to yeah. learn anything from. Yeah, that honestly might be uh, one takeaway from the spring game is Brady Cook cannot get hurt because yeah. there is absolutely nobody else. And... um. When the transfer from Arizona State yeah. gets in, that'll help. But I mean, we were talking. I'm talking about like the quarterback that basically started the spring game is not even on the roster. So that was I was like looking up this guy. I'm like, who is this? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, on, on, he's on last year's roster. I'm like, okay, yeah. But, so a little bit unserious, but that's okay. Yeah. We just, you know, it's good to see the everybody out there in pads and 
uh, to see some football again is nice. Yeah, um, I thought, speaking of just looking at them, looking at Marquise Johnson, Speedy. He looked big. He looked huge. Yeah. Like, I don't know what is what he's listed at, but, man, he looked like he had really bulked up in a short time here. You know what I've learned about the Combine is, no, it doesn't matter what they're listed at because it's wrong. <laughs> That's true. They yeah. lie. Yes. We don't. We never know their actual measurements until isn't they that, go pro. Isn't that insane? Like, they'll get to the Combine and be like, you're like two inches and 10 pounds lighter than yes. like two inches shorter 10 pounds lighter than we thought it is pretty bizarre but it's like, i guess they like, can't force them to tell the truth i guess in college there's nothing actually hinging on it they're growing boys yeah, yeah, yeah. They're always, it's always changing it's changing so fast you know some days they're just two inches shorter <laughs> you know <it> just happens <laughs> yeah it's like the, it starts in high school yeah where they're just like making stuff up just literally making it up and then that just carries on but then it's like you, you usually think when you get to college and they're putting in the numbers, they're not just like copying, pasting from their recruiting yeah. profile. Yeah, it's like actual information people are looking for. You would think they would be correct. Yeah. Got to make them look bigger, faster, stronger. Yeah. Whatever you got to do. Put fear in the opponent. Yeah. <laughs> Intimidation factor. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else from the spring game or um, what's next for football? Are we going to get any 2025 commits anytime soon? Yeah, probably some recruiting stuff will start up soon. Um, start getting some some commits or at least some names to watch probably pretty soon. Okay. Well, um, that's probably it then. Good luck to everybody in our March Madness competitions. We'll see you out there. And... Special thank you to our Patreon supporters at the $10 level and above. Britt Treese, Brian Smith, Ryan Demore, Tristan, Ben Smith, Parker, Daddy JD, Tim Keens, Tyler Harsel, Brandon Groffalo, Brandon Hanks, Matthew Tilly, Louis Hernandez, and Joshua Jacobson. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. We love you. And you can find this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We're on Twitter at Mizzou Sports Pod. And you can email us at Missouri Sports Pod at gmail.com. You can find our t-shirts and stickers on our online shop, Missouri Sports Pod.bigcartel.com. Thank you everyone for listening. We will see you next week.